Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good to be back with with you. This is uh, BHM Big Hairy News, and hello, George. Hello, Chewy. Hey, you doing, Pat? Doing well. Hey, right, folks. George. Hey, folks. Yes. Hey, folks. That's an interesting word, folks, isn't it? Always things kind of folksy. I don't know. Anyway, hey, it's one back. I've used for a long time, but it's especially handy when you're trying not to say guys to a glass a classroom full of uh, varying genders. Is that something that's a no, not nothing's a problem, but it's, it's something that has been said you should avoid. Because I call everyone guys. I use that as sort of a universal term and mate no, as well. It was, it's just an easy thing that I, I right. could do because I already used folks heaps. So rather than even getting into a situation where someone goes, um, we're not guys, you just avoid it altogether by saying, hey, yeah. folks. I don't even think it would be a problem. It's just one yeah. of those things, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Joey, how are you, mate? Good to have you back. Haven't seen you for a wee while. You spent uh, some of last week in uh, Capital Wellington. How was all? How was Wellington? Yeah, real good. Caught up with some people I haven't seen since pre-COVID. Or in oh, wow. one case, like pre pre twenty twenty COVID. Yeah, pretty much. Wow. Um, so yeah, spent a bit of time wandering around and catching up with people. Going to my first um, proper international music gig since since pre-covid right which is awesome really really good these couple of years have absolutely flown by eh? like my mum passed away in 2018 and i spent a lot of time in auckland in 2018 like i was probably up there six times you know including the funeral and stuff at the toward towards the end of the year then i didn't go up in 2019 at all and i was like oh you know 29. I was up there six times last year or whatever it was. I'm just going to take a bit of a break and, you know, knuckle down. And then, of course, COVID hit. And it means I haven't been up to see my family in Auckland uh, since since the end of 2018. And we're in 2022 now. And it's something when I say that, that I would normally do every single year. But in those two years, just gone bloop, and they're, they've disappeared, just gone into the ether like like they didn't even happen. But it's amazing how time flies and then, and then you realize how long it's been since you've done anything. And yet has seemed to be the longest two years in the world at yeah. the same time yeah that's interesting isn't it <laughs> yeah i wonder i wonder when we will get back to this idea of i i know what whatever the new normal is because i don't think we're in the new normal yet i mean there is a possibility it will go back to the way it was if COVID eventually does turn into you know the bird flu scenario or the swine flu that just disappears um but if not, I wonder when there will be a new normal, like a new, this is how it is now. Because it seems that that's still a little bit in flux. You know, we're in an in-between stage at the moment between a new normal, a normal, and an old COVID. Mm. No, very true. I think everybody's in a hurry to put it behind them. Might be a good but time. We ain't there yet. No, but we might as well just start. We weren't going to start with this, but we might as well start with the thing we're talking about it. Um so, I mean, the, the COVID situation, uh, not to, you know, I, I know I, I don't want to be the purveyor of doom. I don't want this thing to be that. And for us to constantly be talking about be aware, be aware, you know, COVID's out there, be aware. But we have kind of been saying all the way through, especially in the last, since Omicron kind of reached a peak and started to peter out, we've all heard stories about how, you know, people are now just staying home and being sick rather than ratting and then going you know and then informing the ministry but it seems now that we are getting sort of official advice that the numbers are way higher currently than what is being reported and they've done that through wastewater testing the wastewater testing obviously this there's, there's going to be some formula for the amount of virus that's shed in waste human waste and if they multiply that number by X, they're going to get the number of people with COVID. 
Um, and so now they've got some sort of hard data as to how big the numbers could actually be versus what they actually are. Let's have a look at the story at TVNZ, eh? The answer's in the water, and the data doesn't lie. Wastewater results reveal COVID is still rife, with the real size of the outbreak likely much larger than daily case numbers claim. Now that we've moved to rat testing and other more self-reported um, ones, we're not capturing every case in New Zealand. And the wastewater is clearly showing that we have an ongoing levels in the community. With a warning to anyone thinking the pandemic is done. Somewhere between five and 10,000 cases a day is still a very significant number of cases, which uh, only a few months ago, and certainly six months ago, would have been a panicked state. Of and see, that's something we've actually been talking about on the show, yeah? We've been kind of talking about the idea that if this had have been six months ago and it had have been 12,000 cases a day, we'd still be in red. And so now that the wastewater is kind of showing, if it says six, it might be 12, or if it says five, it might be 10. I, I wonder what that means if the government is following the science, because if they're following the science and there's that many cases, does that mean that there's going to be a step back towards some restrictions that there were or, or not? I don't know. Of New Zealand. In Auckland, where case numbers are dropping off, wastewater again. So there you go. Let's just have a look at the graph. So uh, new cases that are getting reported, well, that's right about right on a thousand, isn't it? It's right in the middle there of zero to two, pretty much. Yet wastewater says it's more like just under 5,000. So that's a horrific increase. So let's call that 1,000 and let's call that, let's say, 4,500. So imagine if it was the same around the country, more than four times the number. Imagine if that 5,000 was actually 20,000. You know, but this is what the wastewater results are showing versus, um, I actually, I should, all sh I should probably actually think as well, there might, would there be a delay? because what's reported to, on this day might be from a few days earlier. But actually it wouldn't be from that much earlier, would it? Because if you tested positive today and you had a P today, it's gonna to be on the same day. I'm just trying to think that through for a second. But you can see that the wastewater results are significantly more than what's being reported. And if it was like a four times increase, then that's something to be aware of. Imagine if it was four times the 5,000 we were aiming for and it was 20,000. That was when we were in lockdown, pretty much the whole country in red. Yeah, I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, you know, if you didn't have like really severe symptoms and that sort of thing, would you really want to take a rat test and, and then call your boss and say you can't come in for a week and deal with however your boss is going to react to that? You know, uh, businesses aren't necessarily paying out COVID sickness uh, unless you've got normal sick pay. You know, that that's a tough call for a lot of people. And I know talking to friends, I was talking to friends probably three or four months ago when, when Omicron was still at its peak, who owned a cafe up in Christchurch saying that people are coming there and we're not really scanning anymore, obviously, but they're not scanning in uh, because they don't want to be caught up in a, you know, having to isolate. That was the time where, you know, you could be a, a close contact and have to isolate, not just a household contact. And also saying exactly what you're saying three or four months ago, that if they were testing positive, they weren't going to phone it in because they didn't want to then be put in the databases having had it and then have to have the restrictions placed on them. So if that was happening then, it must be even more happening now. You know, you know we we have this natural attrition thing where we um, we get slack, we get comfortable or whatever. And there's that probably added on to the whole, well, it's not such a big deal, added on to I don't want to be locked down. I mean, we had COVID in this house, as you guys know, um, and from someone else having it. And it's a real pain in the ass to be locked down for seven days. It's like a real imposition. Um, but it's what we're supposed to be doing. So I understand people are not phoning through or not paying attention. Those numbers, though, the ones we're looking at over there, they are shocking. From 1,000 to 4,000, that's a shocking increase of what the wastewater results show versus what's being reported. Well, the argument here in Dunedin as well, um, you know, we've had um, the the hospital basically not letting visitors in and yep. and restricting access and that sort of thing because they're under pressure. But there's been absolutely no uh, mitigation in, in the South uh, for managing this. Uh, it was the same in Invercargill, I believe. They had a, a couple of rest homes and their hospital locked down. 
Yep, and then um, there's this as, this as well. This is part of a Dunedin. This is from the critic, the student newspaper. Hundreds hospitalized by flu. Mm. Worst is yet to come. Scores of students struck senseless by speedily spreading sickness. Uh, struck senseless. There could be lots of things that strike a student senseless, but they're they're claiming it's the flu. Hot on the heels of Omicron. Now this is even that's a concern. Hot on the heels of Omicron still here. We're just mm. seeing the numbers, but. So that narrative is a, is a concern as well. But anyway, hot on the heels of Omicron, a flu outbreak is now ripping its way through North Deep. Dunedin Hospital has already admitted nearly 200 emergency cases with many more expected in the community. So you've got that going on as well. The, the article goes on to talk about, I'm paraphrasing, but we haven't had flu season for like two years, two full winters. So we haven't had you know you might catch something last year and it kind of makes you a bit more immune for next year with the flu and that we haven't had that so they're expecting a really bad flu season as well on top of omicron um which is as we can see still out there and still rampant we will go on with the story and the reporter says in the story that although we're looking at auckland these numbers are reflected through the whole country i don't know if they, she's saying they're exactly the same like four times but the wastewater results are showing a significant increase to the reported results We'll get that. We'll let a bit more of this play, shall we? Shows the virus remains strong, a trend mirrored nationwide. I don't think we're in the peak uh, because that peak was earlier in the year, of course, but what we're seeing is a steady plateau, I think is the best word for it. But when asked about reinfection, how severe new variants are, or whether COVID is the new flu, the ministry had a similar response. I'm not sure we have a precise answer for that right now. We don't have enough experience here in New Zealand. It's still unknown at this point. So, you know, New Zealand has caught up to the rest of the world and we're learning these things pretty much at the same time as everybody else. And our findings on long COVID. We're just getting underway with that programme of work. A clear sign as we settle into winter, there's more we don't know than do about a virus still strongly spreading nationwide. So the, the I mean, we've had Dr. Anna Brooks on this show uh, a few times, in fact, for a, for a one hour special one time. She's, I would suspect, New Zealand's leading expert when it comes to long COVID. She's basically doing that as her research now and has been doing it the whole time COVID's out. Um, and there, and when last talking to her, she pointed out about some of the narratives within the media. I'm not blaming the media because it could have been said from up higher that have been really harmful for this. One of the ones about Omicron is it's not as serious. She says the genoming and stuff, when you look at it, it is actually as serious as the first uh, the first Delta, D1, whatever they call it, the OG Delta, uh, sorry, Delta, uh, the OG COVID. Um, but it's just because we're all immunized. Uh, we it, It's affecting us in a less serious way, but the actual virus is as serious. And that idea about it being not as serious has been a real, um, like not as harmful. Like the virus is pretty much the same when it comes to harm. We're just handling it better because we're immunized. And I wonder about this whole... You know, like I just read that article from the from the critic, it's, you know, on the heels, on the heels of Omicron. That means it's behind us. It's not. I'm just saying it's still here and it's still rampant. So the story goes on to also talk about, um, you know, what they did and how they did it. Uh, there's also uh, new variants and subvariants coming out. BA5, BA4 were detected in the community. Uh, epidemiologist Michael Baker subsequently said he was not surprised new Omicron um, subvariants were found in the community as new variants were more infectious. Uh, Ministry of Health lead scientist, advisor Fiona uh, Callaghan, Callaghan? Callahan, said currently the BA2 variant was responsible for over 95% of the reported community cases. How do they know that, I wonder? Because no one's sending in genoming at the moment, are they? We're just doing rats at home and saying, yep, I've got it. So I wonder how they know the answer. They're there. guessing with maths. Right. They do it all the time. Because okay. <laughs> that's that's a good you know, model for maths, just having a, having a bit of a guess. Yeah. Um, the, possible, the possibility of people catching COVID-19 every year was an area of active discussion, discussion, she said. And that's the other thing that when we last talked to um, Anna, it was like, what no one's really talking about, maybe this is the start of it, is reinfection rates. And for people who have had it, I mean, we get people who watch watch this who have told us they've had it twice in six weeks. Um, and so when you talk to people, and I've had this conversation with people I know, you know, I, I just, maybe I'll just get it now and just get it, get on with life and just get it. And I'm like, well, what happens in six weeks' time when you potentially could get it again? Are you just going to get it again? Or are you just going to act? You know what I mean? So it's, yeah, 
all, all I guess I'm wanting to say without being a purveyor of doom is it's still out there and we should still, I think, be very wary of it, in my opinion. And there's yeah. still so much about it that's unknown. So, you know, rolling the dice and catching it and maybe catching it twice in, a, in less than a month and a half. Um, you know, have you doubled your chances of getting long COVID? You know. Yeah. Also, other people reporting it's, it is more anecdotal. I haven't seen this in the research or the data, but, you know, that when they get it again for a second time, I've, had, I've read several people I'm saying on Facebook and various uh, you know, social medias that they've got it worse the second time than the first time. I wonder, I don't know what the research is, but I wonder if you get it and it's not too bad first time around. I wonder if that sets you up for a worse one second time around or not. I don't know. Probably shouldn't yeah. speculate. I mean, yeah, it, it's not surprising that the Ministry of Health and uh, Dr. Ian Town there and that sort of thing is saying, you know, oh, we're just getting started because, I mean, as as you as you're saying, the, the the research that they depend on from people like Dr. Anna Brooks and that sort of thing to make their decisions is only just starting, and the things that they're studying are only just just happening. But yeah, I think that's a going to have to be a a, a priority though the whole long COVID thing, which means like and when when Ian Town Dr. Ian Town says like that the ministry needs guidelines, what he's saying is like they need like Basically, when someone comes into the hospital um, and, and they've had COVID, then that can then mean A, B, or C, and then they can treat them in this sort of way, um, or their symptoms will do this and that, right? Rather than the complete sort of um, uh, stabs in the dark that we're at at the at the moment. And just personally having COVID a couple of weeks ago now, and and always being afraid of this the, the long COVID sort of theory uh yeah i hope they sort of <laughs> find out more about it because it, it does it freaks me out well i mean but you're feeling pretty good eh? i think long covid would be showing itself more so it's not like i don't think my understanding of long covid it's not like oh i'm feeling really good now for the next six months and then i, I get a relapse or something it's something that like you can't get over you're still exhausted six weeks later it's you know it's still ongoing you're feeling pretty good though aren't you I guess what I mean is the uh, the long term impacts of having COVID. Yeah. yeah, well, they do talk about long COVID being sort of the next um, pandemic, so to speak. Not that it's a pandemic because it's COVID, but you know that there could be a lot of people with long COVID, and that could be the next significant worldwide health issue, um, having to help people and deal with people who are, have ongoing effects from. Actually, speaking of that, George, you did lose taste for a while. Has it all come back and stuff? Taste and smell. No, no, I still, I still don't have full taste. Taste is wow. still weird. Yeah, it's still so, got this weird mutedness to it. So what, like it's like a if you ate something sweet, you can taste the sweetness, but it's not like sweet sweet. It's like a dull sweet. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, everything is dull and 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 muted. It's just sort of the general outline of the flavour. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, there you go. That's that's uh, that's shocking. And um, it, it's as, bizarre. Yeah. Have you, have you, did you play with it at all? Did you try licking the soap and see what it was like, like some people do? Maybe. <laughs> I'll take Actually, that as a yes. It's tangentially related to that, um, and <laughs> to take us off COVID for a little bit. I watched a video on YouTube the other day um, where these guys were basically trying to play pranks on each other um, by messing with their food and seeing what their reaction was. And they found out in their in their group that um, one of the guys just didn't taste things the same way wow. as anybody else. Like they loaded a burger with something called malic acid, which is what makes like sour candies like really sour. They put a shit ton of it in the burger patty. And he's like, nom, nom, nom. this burger's really good. Wow. Um, and everyone's like, what the f what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> like, are you broke? Well, maybe that's it. Maybe I, I will. Maybe this is my new. Ta these are my new sort of taste bud characteristics or powers. Right. Give, give, give your taste buds a taste. Get a bag of malic acid. Try that. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. Like a lemon to, to to find the sweet, like the sweetest thing you could, the sourest thing you could. The I don't know what else is umami. That's one of the tastes, isn't it, in your mouth? Umami mm. taste, and try and see what the what the vibe is, because it would be interesting. I mean, we all hope that it's not ongoing, George, but if it was, to then figure out what your new palate is and therefore what tasted good with this new palate. Like, are mm. you gonna, are you like, are you someone who's like a sweet tooth now and will you become someone who likes savory because because of a, a changing palate or whatever? Yeah. 
both. Yeah, <laughs> meat, pies, yeah. 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 <laughs> fudge, well, fudge, Russian fudge, pixie caramel. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Big Mac. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. good. Um, <laughs> yeah. So look, guys, just look, all I'm all I'm I'm encouraging for people who are watching last night. You saw you saw me blow a bit of a foo foo valve over the media and you know, not asking and answering questions. And I did a big spiel there about we will always lead you to water. You know, that's the objective of what we do to give you the information, then how you deal with that is up to you. So the information from that is COVID is still out there. Omicron is still out there. It's still significantly out there. Auckland's research shows it could be four times as high as what's being reported. Um, I'm sure there are numbers for what a nationwide, but they only had Auckland's number numbers there. So just look after yourselves. I mean, as much as you can. Nothing's guaranteed, and you know, no one, no one should be embarrassed. Or I, I don't, I don't think that stigma is there anymore about getting COVID. At the start, there was a bit of a stigma about getting it. I don't think that's there now. But, but you know, look after yourselves, and and I would encourage people to to set up some practices to a, to attempt not to get it. If you get it, you get it. Not a big deal. Life goes on. But to set up a practice to lower the chances of getting it because yeah we still don't know so much about it anyway anywho um uh, our second conversation for today is one that is a little bit close to my heart uh my one time morbidly obese heart <laughs> i'm 24 kilos down at the moment so nice. you know just put that out there i mean there's i'm probably a third of the way there but I'm down 24 kilos, so I'm, I'm pretty happy about that. Um, but there was an interesting conversation on the AM show this morning, and the conversation was around obesity. It's always interesting where, where these, these people are like, and these, uh, these media outlets are like, you know, we shouldn't really talk about a topic unless we're represented by people within the conversation. And then they get no fat people on to talk about how being fat is not normal, which is one of the quotes that will come out of this as well. Um, so I, 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 I can speak to this, obviously, um, and it is one of those areas in life that I think, and I'm not playing the victim here going, no, it's the one area that people are allowed to abuse, but it is a funny, you don't get too many um, other parts of who you are as a human being or what you do that get attached to other words to mock you. Like, for example, a big fat liar. So mm. you're a liar. But they add the big fat to it, so it's seen as a another negative on top of the negative, you know. Um, it, it's you don't really get that in any other instance. Oh, you're a big tall liar, you know. It's just not something that you hear. So the word fat and and you know, I think the communication around people being fat is. I, I'm not, I'm not wanting to portray it like it is a massive victim card. But it seems to be one of those areas in society that we are really comfortable with just being harsh and cold about and basically think, well, they can just sort it out. They can just stop eating and, you know, they can, everything will be all right after that. So here's a conversation that went on um, the AM show this morning. Uh, Louise Wallace uh, hits out at fat women in fashion advertising during the AM panel. Uh, the first clip we're going to look at, um, Nathan, that's Nathan King from Z, yeah? Um, so Nathan is talking about, it was quite funny actually, if you, we're not going to watch the whole thing, but Nathan starts talking about one of the things we can do to help you know, obesity in society. And he talks about a sugar tax. And as soon as he starts talking, he starts talking about we should do something about it, him and Louise, and Louise is nodding away. And as soon as he starts talking about a fat tax, her face is like, oh. And you can just see that she's like, no, nope, not into that, not into the sugar tax. Um, so Nathan's just finished the conversation about a sugar tax, and then the conversation goes on. But are they feeding us that? Hey, fundamental that, just <clears throat> tape over people's mouths with gaffer tape. Yeah. Oh. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Pretty funny. Gaffer tape on people's mouths. That'll solve, that'll solve the problem, my jokey joke. Now just think, and I'm not trying to, to, to be sensitive to this, but just think if that was said about any other physical attribute of a human being in that kind of way like think of a way to make a particularly offensive joke about it that you know that that was the whole studio just laughed at sort of thing it's it's a it, there's an interesting standard for being able to talk about fat people overweight people you know so i mean say it's sooner or numbers, later it's yeah but people. sooner or later surely it's what goes in here yeah, yeah. and what people and i think 
that unfortunately we have normalised the idea of being overweight. Normalised mm. it. And I'll give you an example of that. Is that when I was overseas quite recently, um, you would pass by um, these huge ads and for fashion, like whether, it, I don't know if it was Zara, but something like that, and there would be distinctly overweight women, like, dare I say it, fat women, in these ads advertising clothes, and that is now seen as normal. Doesn't it, doesn't it reflect what normality is? Doesn't it tell people Doesn't that... mean it's right, though, and it's not right, because people are getting sick. If it's unhealthy, yeah. it's not the a thing, good thing. Is, it's a... So there's really interesting words used in that about it's not right. To me, that's a, a value judgment. You know, I think it's okay to put, to put out there you know, it's not a healthy choice. It's an unhealthy situation to be in. We know that. But the, the idea of right, right and wrong, because if it's not right, that means it's wrong. That means to be overweight is wrong. And that's a really heavy way and a heavy language to put on someone. And, and I'll talk about this more shortly, and I'm happy to talk about my own experiences, that it's not quite as easy as, well, just stop eating then. You guys want to jump in before we go on? Yeah, I, I just want to say that the, with these chat panels and stuff like that, that you see this a lot. Just a re, I'm just going to shotgun a real simple reckon out there with absolutely no nuance on it at all. Like, if we want to talk about how New Zealanders are generally heavier than they have been over the last 40 years, let's talk about it. Let's talk about the food options that are available. Let's talk about how much the supermarkets have... Uh, you know what? What's the most affordable foods out there? Yeah, you know, and they're, and in this and in this conversation, Nathan King makes that point. He says, you know, the it's a, it's also a socio socio sociological issue or a yeah. societal and, issue that the cheapest foods are often the worst for you as well. And if we want to talk about advertising, let's talk about the fact that this is probably quite jarring to her because we've had again since for as long as advertising has existed, we've had really really thin people for everything and now we're seeing more advertising reflecting who's going to be wearing these clothes and she's like oh they're fat you know they they might be they might also be normal you know and she's just going oh they're heaps bigger than the the models that we used to have yeah but they're normal people that you would see in the street and that sort of thing so yeah I, when, you know when someone offers opinion and, and we hear this term quite a lot in society today in commentary. And you can go, that opinion is just completely based in some kind of misogyny or sexism or, mm. or white supremacy or whatever it is. The, the way she speaks, I don't know if there is such a thing as like fat phobic, but seems to me to be completely based in that adage of demeaning hatred towards fat people. Oh, you can wrapped, hear it in her voice. Wrapped, wrapped up in a, well, we just want to make them healthier. But it, to me... And, and being honest, who's heard this kind of stuff his whole life, it doesn't come across like someone caring for their health. It comes across like someone going, ooh, fat yeah, people. I, I don't want to see that. Yuck. Yeah. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Yeah, it reminds me of the, I mean, she's, I, you know, I imagine this is why AM Show has done this because of the whole um, Jordan Peterson sort of thing that popped up. Mm. Uh, over the past few weeks about fashion magazines and having women on uh, on the front of fashion magazines and how that was going to destroy the fabric of Western civilization, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I mean, she, the, in this example, she she sort of conflates the words normal with with the words right, um, you know, as in as opposed to wrong, which is uh, a, you know a, a sort of often a sort of language tactic that you'll see that people do just you know subconsciously um which is a great example of what we call ideology right ideology is how things are constructed as look as being normal or, or natural or, or the truth or, or whatever that that is right and you know i mean um that's the the conflation of 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 those two words that she she does there. Um, the other thing would be, uh, sorry, no, you pack, pack, go, you go. I was just going to say as well, what you were saying before, Chewie, about always being skinny, I, it's not actually, I don't actually quite think that's true. It's a, 
there, there were different standards for different eras. Famously, I think Marilyn Monroe, who was a sex icon of her era, was either a size 16 or a size 14 mm. or something. And that was the, you know, we, we all hear about in history, the idea of the Rubenesque woman. And, you know, uh, heroin chic was big in the 1990s, and that's not acceptable yeah. at the moment. And in fact, we can play a little bit here and, and you know, giving Ryan Bridge some credit. You know, he goes on to talk about sometimes, you know, we also think that having models that are too skinny is not acceptable. Mm. But in the same way, there was outcry when we put two skinny models on the front yeah, of the magazine. That's unhealthy skinny. too, though. You just have to be normal. But I yeah. mean, I, I yeah. look at all of us, and you're a bit skinny, but I look at, at, all, at all of us. <laughs> Mate, I've been working out. <laughs> can I just point out as well... What a horrible exercise. Yeah. Well, can I point yeah. out as well, um, a 62-year-old... Ha and and I'm I'm not saying about this anyone in particular, but in general, having plastic surgery to look younger is not normal because that's actually a false image being put forward, and in my opinion, quite an unhealthy one as well, of what's being modelled to society about having people who refuse to look their age and would choose to go have an operation where knives cut into them to look a younger age than they really are. Just kind yeah. of putting that out there as what is and isn't normal. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, like, try to play their own game of what is sort of what's meant to be normal and how we display it. I'd just call her a dumb bitch, you know. We don't really need to <laughs> <laughs> sort of... And and she looks normal, like a... You, know, a, a witch. You, you can't look at somebody in a window who's modelling a fashion brand and perhaps they're a size 16 and say that they're unhealthy. That doesn't mean that they're unhealthy. Mm. Mm, well, okay, well, fine then. Then you, you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. So you either advertise people with, with people who have what I would see as a normal body, maybe a size 12 <laughs> or 14. You put a size she 18 decides. there. People think that's yeah. normal and it's healthy. Might be healthy when you're 25. When you're 55, it won't be. And, and look, this is the thing that, that is difficult with these kinds of conversations. And, and when you, you hear about, like, like I said before, about a conversation or a comment that's wrapped up in some kind of ism, but really the ism uh, is the thing driving the commentary, actually to say carrying too much weight is unhealthy, it's perfectly acceptable. You know, it's perfectly acceptable to have the, to, to have the opinion that, you know, not having as much fat around your vital organs, around your heart, you know, carrying it for wear and tear is a, is a, is a better option than not. But to use words like you are not a normal human being. Now, she didn't say it quite as bluntly as that, but she used the word is not normal. I mean, what is normal? Normal to me would be like what is mostly, what is common. And actually, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but being obese is kind of common in Western society. And then if like what I think Chua, you were saying, if you look in various groups of people, like for example, uh, uh, people with less money, being obese is even more common because as, as we all know, the um, the foods that are accessible to someone with less money are less nutritionist, are less nu full of nutrition, decent nutrition, um, and, but are massive amounts of calories. So it's just th there's a lot that I that we'll we'll play one more clip and then go on. But before we do that, do you guys have anything else? You were going to say something else here, George, and you allowed yeah. me in. Yeah. The the other thing I wanted to mention, and this comes up a lot, is is there's this almost fallacy that is at the center of their conversation, and that's that somehow the billboard fashion billboards that she's seeing are going to sort of, you know, poison people to become fat, right? They, these people put so much sort of faith in the media that they consume for themselves that they just assume that everyone else is like zombies for, for fashion billboards. I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's totally not the case, right? A, a fashion billboard, having someone, you know, Again, the Jordan Peterson example, having someone who who's you know a bit um, bit more chubbier than the traditional fashion um, uh, model on the front of a magazine is not going to make people fat. It's it's food that's going to make people fat. Mm. Yeah, just remember you've got to change your life um, to make sure that this person, Louise Wallace, is is happy. Um, certainly don't factor in your own life or happiness into it. You know, she just doesn't want to see you if, if that's cool. So, you know, just get onto that. Just gaffer tape your mouth shut. 
Yeah. I know whose mouth I'd like to gaffer tape shut. <laughs> That's been suggested in the in the comments as well. Before we play these comments, let's actually put up. Uh, sorry, play the last clip. Let's put some of these comments out there. A couple of comments from Carl. He says once at one at one point, ah, the old adage: if they're not what I consider a healthy size, then they're fat. It's mm. so tiring, to be honest. Carl also goes on to say, uh, what if you're Polynesian? Our body sizes are completely different. Because yeah. um, that's also another thing. Like, I mean, I know she's not saying necessarily BMI, but the lie of the BMI, you know, like if you, if BMI was what we took, then every every male who was a sporting athlete would be morbidly obese because they just purely base it on weight. And, and mm. if you were a muscular, like all the front row of the All Blacks would be on death's door, according to the BMI. So whilst it is a, whilst it is, a yardstick it's not a particularly good one um kim says i imagine that the advertising must work and that's an interesting point as well so louise wallace is kind of putting all this weight into the idea pardon the pun into the idea of what this will do to rather than going oh this is going to sell our clothing louise wallace thinks this is going to sell the the, the person's body and like if it's a if it's a plus size model wearing jeans it seems that she's saying that people are going to see that advertising and not want to buy the jeans but want to look like the model that makes no sense to me whatsoever i think what kim's saying is the advertising mm. must work there must be also pitching to a, a sector of society that needs those genes whatever it is and so you have those people in place if you want to sell a size a pair of size 17 or 18 or 20 genes then it's probably best to use a 17 or 18 or 20 size model as opposed to a size 4 model where the jeans won't look anything like what they'd look on a size 16 or 17 or 18 sized female. I don't know. Um, let's play this last clip. And this is actually going back to the sugar tax, which is why I didn't pay the first one. And Nathan has an idea of how the sugar tax could actually work. Down. I'm going to say real quick that people slam this whole sugar tax going, oh, it doesn't work. But mm. what if we, like, you, substitute, you take that money and you put it towards something like, picture this, like a My Food Baggy kind of thing, but it's it's available for the nation, yeah. it's run more centralised, and it's like, because obesity is a problem for, so it's socio-economic as well, mm. and because cheaper food is usually more unhealthy, and I'm like, let's subsidise like a, a healthy food thing, box, that you can get, get the whole nation eating healthy, New Zealand could be a very awesome place. Now I'm going to cut off the last comment from her, because as we've all said, no one else wants to hear. <laughs> oh, you can tell she's you. winding up to something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She wants to tell people to plant veggie gardens. That was what her comment is afterwards. She's like, oh, I get it. It's so basic. Gardens. It's so mm. basic. You know, when, you know, she's harking back to the good old days of every family having a veggie patch. Yeah. Do you know what else was, was common around there? One not, person working. And also not mm. living till you were 62, yep. like she is. It's not very normal based on those I standards either. Doing a veggie patch is fucking work. You yeah. need someone there to tend it. And generally that was the person that stayed mm. home. You know, that that was my family growing up in the eighties. Let me also oh. and I'm, this is gonna sound really arrogant, but I think for forty years of overweightness I've got some some say in this, right? It's my lived experience. Um <laughs> some drop some knowledge on the on the overweight issue, right? And this is this is for real. If people are significantly overweight, we're not talking about five or 10 kilos, but significantly overweight, then I believe that the most likely chance is they probably have food addiction issues. Because you have to say without question, to get 30, 40, 50, 100 kilos overweight, and they're the people I'm talking about, you have a bad relationship with food. You can't not get to that point and not have a bad relationship with food. Now that might be a psychological issue, and you use food as an outworking of it, it might be an addictive issue directly to food. and what I learned about myself at one stage in my life was I used food like an alcoholic used alcohol. So if you think about what an alcoholic would do with alcohol, that's what I did with food. Now, it was very difficult for me to have people I know say to me, well, just, you know, go on a diet, just stop eating. You know, that's, and it was like saying to an alcoholic, well, that's a piece of piss, just stop drinking, right? So that, that's the first thing to think about when you're, thinking of and looking at significantly overweight people. The second thing is, I read a book by a guy, uh, actor in America, who talks about his food addictions. I can't remember his name. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter. But he talks about how an addiction to heroin is sexy, but addiction to food is not. An addiction to food is also the only addiction that you have where you have to keep using the thing you're addicted to or else you'll die. 
If you're addicted to a drug, if you're addicted to alcohol, if you're addicted to porn, you don't need that in your life to actually continue living. Think about if you were addicted, if you were an alcoholic, but every day you still had to have a liter of alcohol to survive for the rest of your life. Or if you're a heroin addict and every day you had to have one shot for the rest of your life to survive. That's what it's like for someone who's got a food addiction. They have to continue to have a relationship and interact with the thing that has caused them their troubles and their health and that they're addicted to, but not just put it to the side and go cold turkey or figure out a way through you know, counseling and hard work to not need it anymore. They always need it or else they will die. So it's a very different scenario. Yeah, you know, Paul's saying you can die from heroin withdrawal. I know, but you can also get through that and then not need heroin. But the heroin withdrawal can be immediate and can happen there and then. But after you've gone through that, it doesn't happen a year later. Um, so so it's I, I, I've found for me, and I think it's important for people to know to think about it in a different way, you know. To me, to think about, again, significant weight issues, not the five or ten kilos overweight, but the 40 or 50 kilos overweight you should you should be thinking about them like an, an addict like an alcoholic with alcohol I'll, I'll give you an example right i did a quiz online talking about al uh, about alcoholics and it was like do you ho hide alcohol around the house yes i did that with food do you uh you know do you tell lies to cover your intake of alcohol yes i did that with food so like all of those boxes i would tick as well do you, you know, do you sometimes, are you sometimes short of money for the monthly bills because of you spending it on food? Yes, I've done that as well. It is really paralleling for a lot of people all the way through. And it's a different concept and a different aspect for people when you understand it's not just lazy, fat people who won't stop putting gob stuff in their mouth. For some people, maybe for a lot of people, I'll say for a lot of people who are significantly overweight, it's a real problem with food that's a lot harder than just stop eating and exercise. Like people like this crazy old bint is going on about, you know, it's not just as simple as that for a lot of people. Um, and for me, like I said, I'm down 25 kilos, 24 kilos. Uh, it's been 40 years to get to a point where I've been able to, I've been on this journey where I am right now for, t for since I was 40. So for, you know, seven, eight years. And, it's taken me another seven or eight years to get to a point where I've had the ability to actually then do that. So I'm just putting it out there. I'm not trying to, you know, say woe is me because it's not. But when we think about other people and we think about people who are going through that, I would just encourage people not to think about, you know, look at that disgusting, lazy, fat person. All that. I wish they'd just stop eating and exercise. If you wouldn't think it about an alcoholic or a, someone I mean, I guess you could think about it. Someone who's got a porn addiction, just stop watching it. But you don't typically think about that. Or or a drug addict or something like that. Then you shouldn't be thinking about it, about someone who's 100 pounds or 50 kilos overweight. That's all. Yeah, good point. Good point. I thought that the, the idea from the dude of sending little veg vegetable boxes around the country was very cute. <laughs> like, a little dude, Nathan. Yeah, I mean, I guess yeah. he's, I mean, you know, he's a he's a good egg, is Nathan, um, and he's looking. But it for, is, yeah, I mean, he's look, it's he's sort looking, of he's indicative looking, of these the, these sort of uh, little ideas where really we've already got supposedly a system set up called a, a a nation state with a welfare system with regulatory powers. Um, that is failing because there's a duopoly there's um food that is bad for you that's cheaper than food that is good for you yeah uh, and so i i guess that's why i i it, it rubs me the wrong way the little boxes of vegetables fair enough i think what he's probably thinking about um if we tax for example the coca-colas and pepsis of this world what are we going to do with that, that money, money goes. what are we going to yeah. do with that money to help the issue so i wouldn't be surprised if that was a little idea off the top of his head but um, actually, Crazy Old World has just talked also about, I mean, if sometimes you struggle to relate to an idea or of like a heroin addict, then just think about smokers. You know, we all know how hard it is to give up smoking. Yeah, And, and yes, there is one in a thousand smokers that just work, that go cold turkey and they just stop one day and they never pick up another one. But for most of them, it's a real struggle and it takes a really long time to get rid of that habit. Not just the chemical addiction, but the habitual one. I have to tell mm. you, I mean, I wasn't ever really a smoker. 
But you know, in my twenties at university, at a pub with a drink, you know, you'd you'd light up or you'd get one off your friend or that kind of stuff. And I still find myself when I when I have a beer in my hand or something, I still find myself doing this when I'm holding the beer, because it's habitual. And I haven't smoked since I was at university, you know, twenty plus years. But there is a habitual thing to break as well as a, a chemical thing to break with smoking. And I and I say to you again, it's the same in food. Uh, I don't know necessarily about chemical, but there is a nutritional thing to break and there is a habitual thing to break. How many people out there kind of at nighttime when they're not hungry just go, mm, I just feel like something while I'm watching television and that mm. becomes the cycle and that becomes the habitual thing that you need to break. I'm just thinking more thinking more about it like 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 an addiction as opposed and i'm not trying to you know play the violin and say everybody out there who's morbidly obese just be so nice to them now and you know they need i'm just saying and honestly if you see someone who is morbidly or if you have someone in your life who you never thought this before think about them like an addict think about their relationship with food like a smoker is to to tobacco or an alcoholic is to alcohol or a drug user is to to drugs if they're addicted that is obviously and it changes your perspective it also makes it much easier to think about how to help them because all of a sudden they're not just fat, disgusting things on a billboard. They're um, people who have value and need help and, you know, need support rather than just being scorned as, well, we don't want to normalize this, do we? I'm just imagining uh, Louise's head exploding to this whole conversation and yeah. it's, uh, it's very satisfying you know I, <laughs> I i i really dislike those those just real basic reckons that we get on tv and and stuff like that whereas in the chat that we've just had we've gone okay here's like you got the supermarkets you got the socioeconomic you got the psychological you got the addiction based issues that's that's what obesity is there, there's everything there but uh, for louise it was billboards Mm. I don't want to see fatties on a billboard. Mm. Um, my kids have been in the room next door, my little lounge there. For some reason, the TV's just turned on as blaring. Can you guys hear it? No, it's okay. no. Oh, I might have just turned off. I was just going to get up and go and turn it off, but that's right. I think it's. I think probably what one of them did, the little morons, is they probably <laughs> cast their phone to the. Oh, it's playing again now. You can't hear that. Uh, it's no. fine, Pat. It's fine. All right. All right. I won't get up and change it then. I'll try and. I'll try and ignore it. Yeah. So look, thanks guys. And thank, I mean, like, I don't, I don't need any, I mean, the point, one of the points for me is I haven't talked about this publicly. I don't think, have I, George? Might've, might've skimmed over it a couple of times lightly. Um, but one of the things with me is every time one of my habits of doing this kind of, you know, healthy eating, falling off the way again, healthy eating is, is kind of talking about it publicly mm. and getting a whole bunch of kudos from people and then feeling good about the kudos and then sort of giving up on it. So I'm kind of keeping it to myself. I haven't really haven't really talked a lot about it because of that reason. So I'm just going to keep going on and I'll talk to you about it again, June of next year <laughs> when I'm finished. <laughs> um, listen, uh, George, you're going to lead this next bit. Um, you're going to tell me we want to play my bit because we're going to talk about Matthew McConaughey and the conversation he had. I am going to go right, and turn, right, right. I am going to go and turn that off because right. I'm not, I'm not able to concentrate with it going on. So I'm going to leave you two guys for a minute or two while I go and turn that uh, television off. And we're moving into Matthew McConaughey and his response to Uvalde. Over to you, boys. Yeah, uh, Matthew McConaughey was at the White House in Washington, D.C. I didn't know this till today, but he's from Uvalde, Texas. Oh, OK. I didn't know Which, that. Yeah, yeah, right. That, that it, it all made sense once I realized that because, you know, I... He's not trying to sell any movies at the moment. Uh, there's no big Matthew McConaughey movie coming up. Uh, it was all very, uh, all a very serious visit. I mean, he's a, he he's a, uh, I mean, he, it's, it's Hollywood, but he still sort of symbolizes a, a sort of southern uh, sensibility and a, a responsible gun owning sensibility. Uh, anyway, he went to the White House. He talked to uh, Joe Biden um, before giving an address in uh, the the press briefing room. Uh, but just quickly, he also met with the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who really this is all going to sort of 
uh, depend on uh, if legislation um, in terms of uh, gun ownership is, is to come in. But anyway, before we talk about that sort of thing, we might as well just... Yeah, uh, Kim says, wasn't he going to run for us? Yeah, there was some, there was rumours about him running for governor in Texas, but uh, yeah. Why anyway. would you? I mean, like, I mean, not to cut off that conversation, why the hell would you? If you're a bloody movie star worth $50 million, why the hell would you get into that game? I, I don't, I don't understand why. That's American politics that. now, isn't it? Celebrity. Yeah, still. I mean, just retire and, and spend your life with your shirt off on the beach. That's basically his email, isn't it? Well, and it, I mean... <laughs> He'd be able to do way less in terms of the issues he's passionate about if he was governor of Texas. Yeah, yeah, true. I'm here today in the hopes of applying what energy, reason, and passion that I have into trying to turn this moment into a reality. Because as I said, this moment is different. We are in a window of opportunity right now that we have not been in before. A window where it seems like real change. Real change can't happen. Uvalde, Texas is where I was born. I swear my, my mom taught kindergarten less than a mile from Rob Elementary. Uvalde is where I learned to master a, a, a daisy BB gun. Took, that took two years before I graduated to a 410 shotgun. Uvalde is where I was taught to revere the power and the capability of the tool that we call a gun. Uvalde is where I learned responsible gun ownership. Now, Uvalde. So yeah, he's, as I said before, he's from Uvalde, uh, and he's just been down there as, as well. Him and a, him and his missus went down and basically hung out with the community, uh, and now he's back in DC to to uh, give this speech. Do you think that any part of what he's saying, though? And like, obviously, his his heart's in the right place and his passion's in the right place. But as soon as he talks about a gun being a tool, do you think there's any element of that which is minimising the gun being a weapon of war? I mean, I know it's, farmers here would use it as a tool because you know they they use it for pest eradication that kind of stuff. But I don't know. When I hear that, I just go, I wonder what he means by that. I I think he's taking the right tact there. Like he yeah. can't get out there uh, on the White House dais as someone from Texas to go get rid of all guns. It's too big. It's never going to happen. He's he's right. swinging into we've got to get rid of the 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 bad guns. So he's he is talking about we should be using guns as tools when he uses that word. You're saying yeah. I think I, I think he's you know your hunting weapons, your rifle, shotguns, that sort of thing. I I think the only way that this would have any sort of traction if they were going to change any of their gun laws is to say high capacity um semi-automatic or automatic weapons is 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 what you'd go after you wouldn't get rid of handguns you wouldn't get rid of guns as a whole yeah right you know um but i i think i think the danger of having a, a, an actor get up there and i'm not doubting his genuineness there but you see an actor you think is he acting yeah you know and that, that's the danger he's he's got the he's got the reach he's got the the name power the recognition yeah um but i can just see it being turned around going there's an actor acting you know because actors are really good at portraying emotion well we should it's genuine George, or not george maybe this is the time that i should play my part of this clip and the reason that i'm playing this part and george is not is because I think you're basically paying a replay of the live stream or the live video. And in that, there was only a one camera shot. But there's a point in the conversation where he talks about something that someone's holding over in the corner. And obviously, they put it in in post. So we thought we'll play play it from the, the clip that I've got. And then you can see when you're talking about the passion, you can see what he's when that comes out in this conversation. And, you know, it's interesting how you would word that, Chewy, because I would look at this and go, to have this kind of emotional outburst, if it's not genuine, deserves an Oscar. Now, I'm not saying he deserves an Oscar for doing this because I think this is genuine, but I think you can see. I don't know if you can always tell, um, I, I think but, I, but I think you can well. see it. So he's talking about a girl, one of the girls who was killed, and both myself and George, when we heard the line that you will hear, went, "Shit, you'll hear it." Here we go. My mate, they wanted to be a marine biologist. 
she was already in contact with Corpus Christi University of A&M for her future college enrollment. Nine years old. Maite cared for the environment so strongly that when the city asked her mother if they could release some balloons into the sky in her memory, her mom said, oh no, Maite wouldn't want to litter. <laughs> Maite wore green high top converse with a heart she had hand drawn on the right toe because they represented her love of nature. Camilla's got these shoes. Can you show these shoes, please? Wore these every day. These are the same green converse on her feet that turned out to be the only clear evidence that could identify her after the shooting. Oh, Jesus. How about that shit? Mm -hmm. Then there was Ellie Garcia, a 10-year-old. So, look, and her I mean, the stories they tell about all the kids, obviously, are, are, are needed to be told and worth being told, but that one in particular... Um, I wanted to make sure we heard you and Chewy, you just had the, exactly the same reaction as, as all that the, me and George, probably all of us had, you know, we think about, we think about these kids and we think about people being shot in these mass shootings and we think about what they could do. But when you hear someone say that the only way they could identify the body was based, just think about your child or a person in your life or whatever, how, how damaged they would need to be to not be able to identify them. And those shoes that you're seeing on your screen, one of the children was wearing, and that's how they identified the body. I mean, that's the reality of what we're talking about here. You know, not some, not not that anyone has really downplayed it or sanitized it, but it's this is not your call of duty, you know, scene with dead bodies laying all over it. This is children who can't be identified any other way other than their shoes after that shooter went through. Yeah, so, I mean, McConaughey definitely, you know, there was that, that passionate pathos in, in his speech. When we get to the, the meat and potatoes of it, um, there's sort of the same old stuff there, right? We need to reach across the aisle. I don't know if you it's four minutes, um, Pat, so maybe just let us know when you, when you yeah, want we'll to stop Yeah, we'll just play a bit of it, eh? And then we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll cut out at some stage. But again, you, you know what? Every one of these parents wanted what they asked us for, but every parent separately expressed in their own way to Camilla and me that they want their children's dreams to live on, that they want their children's dreams to continue to accomplish something after they are gone. They want to make their loss of life matter. Look, we heard from we heard from so many people, right? Families of the deceased, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, Texas Rangers, hunters, Border Patrol, and responsible gun owners who won't give up their Second Amendment right to bear arms. And you know what they all said? We want secure and safe schools, and we want gun laws that won't make it so easy for the bad guys to get these damn guns. So we know it's on the table. We need to invest in mental health care. We need safer schools. We need to restrain sensationalized media coverage. We need to restore our family values. We need to restore our American values. <laughs> it is hard can, to hear that voice and take them too responsible seriously. Gun eh? Responsible gun ownership. We need background checks. We need to raise the minimum age to purchase an AR-15 rifle. Well, right. and, oh, and the, and the words as, as well, right? It, it's it's not surprising that he was able to do, do an address from where the Democratic uh, president stands and then go on Fox News uh, and basically say the same uh, exact stuff about family values and, you know, the, the Republican narrative when it comes to these sort of things about mental health. Uh, issues, which are obviously uh, an issue with these things, but are often there to, to um, you know, uh, um, cover over the gun control uh, issues. He's definitely walking a tightrope there. The 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 impassioned declaration of responsible uh, gun ownership and the Second Amendment um, for people like Matthew McConaughey is the you know the farming rural aspect that we talked about 
the sporting aspect that we talked about. Uh, it's not usually actually the Second Amendment thing of having like a well-regulated militia that stands in opposition to the government when necessary. But, you know, it's that sort of like, um, that sort of, I guess, depoliticized rural NRA sort of culture, right? Um, well, that and, still and the, underpins Republican politics. And there's things they could do now. So I, this is not, oh, this is for the show, actually. Gosh, I nearly said it's for the podcast. So I had a conversation today with this guy here, James Hake, the Hake Report. I told a him that if he, lived, if he lived in New Zealand, he'd be called Haki, because that's how we would pronounce his surname. Um, but the Hake Report. And yeah, uh, the, the conversation, which was supposed to last an hour, just, just don't freak out too much, Joey. Went for nearly two and a half hours between me. He and seems him. nice. <laughs> um, but we talked a bit about gun control and, and his position, and we're going to play this on Friday night. So if you want to see this, this is going to play on Friday night into Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so maybe you'll see some of it on Friday night. Maybe you'll watch more of it on demand. But he is a right wing Christian American gun toting loving second amendment person and he's like we have to it's all about the people's heart because if their hearts were right they wouldn't be doing this and i'm like but you can't change that it's like it's like talking about the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff and the and the fence at the top of the cliff at the moment we need to put a fence in place which is making an immediate change which will make some difference to then hopefully no have no need for the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff in a generation. It's not all or nothing. People are like, you know, they, you can't make any difference. Well, if, if they raise the age of legal gun ownership to 21 overnight, then I think the big the big last few, which sounds horrible, but you know, the Sandy Hooks and the and the Rob Elementaries and those ones there that were all 18, 19 and 20 year olds legally wouldn't have been able to purchase a firearm. Now could they still have got them from dad's cupboard? Maybe. Well, that's what maybe. But you know, we don't we don't stop selling alcohol because kids pull it out of their dad's cupboard. You know, we still have restrictions around how old you're allowed to be to buy that sort of thing. And that would have, I mean, that would have stopped this one because he couldn't have gone on his 18th birthday to buy two AR-style weapons to take into this elementary school. So I don't. It just feels so simple to maybe us on the other side of the world. I talked about this last night, Chewy. I watched last week tonight mm. with John Oliver. And John Oliver did a piece on cops and um, cops and schools on Monday's show or Sunday night US time, and he just started the piece by going, "Well, we all know what the issue is with guns, and we know how to solve it. It's gun control." It was just so matter of fact that I think that's true. We sent, I think probably said sensible gun control. We all know that that's the answer that will make an immediate impact. It may not be the long term complete answer, but it's something that could happen now that could make a difference now whilst they work on the other thing would be banning assault rifles now whilst they worked on other issues like in the mental health world that might take a generation to sort out but they're so, not but they but they're using both of them they're using the mental health issue to not do anything now and and the reverse they're not doing anything now because they say it's a mental health issue it's like you can actually do both yeah it, it's it's always one or the other it's it's deflect we want to talk about this this is why this happened it's not this they don't talk about what's the word a holistic like that the the whole thing it's like okay you say there's a problem with mental health uh texas defunded their mental health program by something like 211 million dollars yeah Abbott um cool so put that money back in and they start doing it and we know that these uh, weapons are dangerous and we know that when the federal assault weapons ban uh, ran out, um, mass shootings went up like 400%. So we, yep. we, we know that that's a thing. So let, yep. let's bring that back. Um, we know that the Second Amendment says that the right to bear arms shall not be infringed as part of a well-regulated militia. Cool. Let's fucking nail that down. Yeah. Um, bring which, a regulated means, which, states which actually, militia back in. Which means I said this to to James today. Which means that means you're not allowed to own a gun to shoot into someone's back after they've stolen your TV because that's no. got nothing to do with regular, a well regulated militia. Yeah. 
So it actually is, is not about the Second Amendment. And you'll find that a lot of Americans don't know the quoting of the Second Amendment other than the right to bear arms. They leave mm. out that whole bit about well-regulated because that's probably what people are asking for. This whole thing needs yes. to be well-regulated, like the Second Amendment says. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I would love to, I, I must admit, I haven't dug into this, but I would love to see how the NRA has changed over the decades. Because I know in the immediate post-World War II time, they were all about responsible gun ownership. They had marksman uh, competitions. They trained uh, teenagers in gun safety and, and, and hunting techniques and all of that sort of stuff. And then somewhere, I guess between the 1950s and today, they went insane. And I'm just going to draw a circle around the fact it's probably in the 1970s, 1980s that that happened. But yeah, the NRA is a big problem. My understanding is, and this is from a Michael Moore documentary, so it probably needs to be fact-checked, is the year after they uh, made the KKK illegal was when the NRA started. Now, that's in a Michael Moore documentary. Might be bowling for Columbine. I'm happy to be fact-checked on that, so I, I guess that's second-hand that I'm passing on. But it's um it was is more than just ironic that if, 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 if that is the case that you know one group of gun toting rednecks from the south was banned that potentially another group of gun toting rednecks was begun. <laughs> Did you know there is an alternative to the NRA? Yeah. What's that? The National African American Gun Association. Yeah. Um. I was reading up about it the, the other day because they're doing a big recruitment push for these uh, oh, responsible gun owners that don't agree with um, some of the things that the NRA is going with. Um, but yeah, I just found that that interesting that there is an alternative to the NRA. Looks like George is ready to go to bed. He's rubbing his eyes. His beady eyes for George. Oh, I was just going to say the last the last point I was going to say uh, was I think. And you can check this if you're Googling uh, Chewy, but I think the last time I looked, the NRA membership was some ridiculously low number. I was going to say 35,000. Mm. I, I could be wrong with that. And to think how little, how small the size is of how much power they wield, well, oh, wield, absolutely, is utterly ludicrous. And you think there are so many other groups out there that are so much bigger, they don't have anywhere near the same kind of influence as they do. So um, mm. it's a bit ridiculous. Wait till you hear about banks. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you hear. All right, guys. Wait till you hear about yes. Jeff Bezos. <laughs> well, it's just one man, isn't he, with that influence? <laughs> yeah. Um, anything else, Joey? You didn't give us a um, you didn't give us a gig review necessarily from when you're in Wellington. It was a good. Gig oh, gig. mate, fucking amazing. <laughs> nice to be in the um, crowd again. Did you mask uh, up in it, the crowd, or did you just roll your dot? I your dice? I tried. Yeah, <laughs> it didn't last long, and I, I must admit, I came back thinking, "Oh, I'm going to do some rats when I get home, just to make sure I haven't caught anything." But uh, I seemed to be all good. Everybody was, yeah, real good. It was nice to be in a mosh pit again. Nice. I, I I was fully expecting to sit back at the at the back and just watch, and I think that lasted about three songs before I charged right up. Um center center pit but yeah a lot of fun cool man all right well we're done for a day now just a reminder i mean not, not you need to be reminded but i have a conversation uh with this dude james hake on friday night friday someone's warning you that rats won't be positive until around day five so so you know yeah. this someone yeah, in the yeah. chat's already said that um that's going to play out on friday night so last we, we're kind of turning friday nights into a little bit of a long a, a long whatever conversation, a long form conversation, if we can. Last week we talked to um, Hohepa Thompson about the uh, Hori's Pledge, uh, and I, I quite like the idea of doing this. So this is going to play on Friday night at 10 p.m., uh, and I'm sh I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, the conversation, and of course it will be on demand after that as well. Is it going to make me real fucking angry, Pat? Yeah, yeah, but then you're, <laughs> but you're, but you're ginge. So anger is always just under the surface with you, son. That, that's, um, it's, that's my I, secret. I'm always here, angry. Here's the thing with me, right? I genuinely like to speak to people and understand why they believe what they believe, even if what they believe doesn't make any logical sense. Um, 
So it was a it was actually he do you know who Jesse Lee Peterson is? I can't say I do. Crazy, like crazy American uh black preacher who thinks that uh Donald Trump is the great white hope. Um he's a part yeah. of his his kind of group. <laughs> and, you know, he, he fights against uh criti- criticism of race he said racism doesn't exist and all this kind of stuff. So you you'll okay, so here's what I hope for you, Chua, yeah? I hope he will make you angry and I hope you will be proud and happy of the pushback I gave him because I've said it in the show already. I want to lead people to water. I want to lead him to water on some levels and just give him something that he hasn't thought about. I, towards the end of it, like nine hours in, <laughs> I, um, I was saying bluntly to him in the podcast, you know, you, you claim to be a Christian. You shouldn't be speaking to people like this. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be calling our prime minister um, a horse faced woman or whatever you call it as a part of your broadcast. That's how I found him. I, I was doing some looking around to see who had talked about Jacinda after the Harvard and, uh, commencement. You know, I'm like, if you serve this so called leader, old the old Jesus Christ dude, if, if he wouldn't do it, then you shouldn't be doing it. I I, I actually really I, I think I challenged him. I did get a bit of a fright when he said if he could choose, his, he'd want to make America ninety percent white. And then I actually kind of realized what I was dealing with because it was all pretty well, not necessarily well hidden, but. It, you it, thought it, he was just a right winger. Then you realized. <laughs> yeah. Just right. And when he basically said white replacement theory was a real thing and he believed in it, when he said those two things and he told me he'd use the N word yesterday, I was like, okay, this is a Ooh. different, this is a different kettle of fish. Man's got and brain he, worms. And he happily admitted all that. And so I happily broadcast all that and. People might say of that conversation, why would you platform this? I would say of the conversation, I think that there was not a part of that conversation that there weren't obvious and clear fallacies and holes in his positions. Nothing against him personally, per se. I don't know him as a human being. But I said to him in the conversation, um, you sound like you're talking like you've heard this said by someone and you're just repeating it, that you haven't actually gone and looked at the data yourself. This is a problem in society when we hear someone saying something and then we repeat it without knowing it. I said, when you talk, that's what you sound like. And I guess to his credit, he kind of went, yeah, that's probably fair. So um, yes, Chewy, you will be angry at some of the responses, but hopefully, uh, you will also be happy at the pushback. And if we can be gracious, potentially, uh, maybe some of those, maybe I put some brain worms in there that will sit and impact him at a later date. Like he couldn't come up with a, a cogent argument why gay marriage was bad, same sex marriage was bad. He knew it was bad, but I, I challenged him to not cite his holy book and tell me why it's bad because in society we don't get to cite our holy books when we're talking about policy. And he, and he kind of couldn't. Other than using, you know, uh, yeah, no, he he, he kind of, in my opinion, he didn't couldn't answer it really. Yeah. So. Yes. Surprise, surprise. Yeah, well, I'll, put, I'll, I'll give it a look, but I'm going to put all of my uh, glassware and crockery away. Just, so, I can keep. <laughs> oh, so what you're saying to me is that like quarter past ten on Friday night, I should expect a text. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to turn my phone off. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, we should have gone 10 minutes ago. We're going now. Thanks for joining us again tonight. Look at George. Yes, you can go, George. Why don't you just hang up on us, George? You go first. George, off you go. Go on. Goodbye. See you tomorrow, George. No, nice. Say goodbye to George. He's Not going. Nice. Goodbye, George. Oh, and he hung up on uh, Chewy as well. Sorry about that, Chewy. No, I'm still back. here. Oh, I'm go. still here. So there you go. George is gone. He, he wanted to go to bed. And I'll say goodnight to you, Chewy. I'll say goodnight to George, even though he couldn't man up and make it through the whole show. And uh, um, yeah, we'll catch you all tomorrow night from 10 o'clock. Thanks, team. Enjoy your time. Cheers. Share our shit. Here we all. Bye-bye.